Uh, my name is Joe Scully, and I uh, want to thank uh, Mike for putting this together. This is an awesome thing, this, uh, this uh, group conference. Uh, my background is rodeo, as a lot of people have known. Um, it's in my logo. There's a little cowboy thing, even at a drone race. Cowboy's in my blood. I forgot my belt buckle. I'd show it to you normally. Um, but a lot of the things that I do have roots back down to rodeo. Since three years old, I've been involved in a spectator sport. Since I was 15 years old, I worked in a production capacity. I used to be a rodeo clown. That's why every now and then I'm, I tell some jokes or I fail at attempting to tell jokes. Um, and I do some random uh, theatrical stuff, like sometimes I'll pretend to be a homeless person and roll around in the street <laughs> in New York City. Um, I'm a rodeo clown, that's what I like to do. Come on, man, that's, uh, that's, how, we, uh, that's how we roll. But uh, what I've been able to do is uh, from a rodeo clown, I went into broadcasting because it was the closest field to entertainment. Um, my parents were gonna kick me out unless I went to college. And so I picked the book, through the book, what was the closest thing, police officer, heck no. Um, spent enough time in the police station already in my youth, but then all of a sudden, boom, rodeo clown and radio DJ. And I went through uh, college for that, went into radio, there's no money in radio, got out of that, and everything that I've done just kind of uh, steamrolls into the next thing. I won't bore you with uh, my long stoic history, but again, everything that I do here, even this weekend with, uh, with drone racing, stems all the way back to um, rodeo. And the one thing that uh, the highest level of uh, rodeo is the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association. Their Super Bowl of Rodeo is the first weekend in December in Las Vegas, Nevada. And before that event starts, they do exactly what we're doing here right now, and that is a, a conference. And uh, something for next year, they'll probably do it as name badges. But this is an opportunity to see so many people that have been in the same... <laughs> that wasn't a shot. No, no it was a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> what I was, a lot of people have their names on their shirts, yeah. I didn't want a name, I wear my name like a badge. Um, the, uh, the biggest thing is we see each other's little Facebook profile pictures and some people have pictures of kittens so we don't know who they are. But an opportunity like this to get together and really start to put names to faces and uh, some people will get up here and you know the first gen of this is experts or industry insiders but as this grows year after year we can all grow together. And, with FPV racing, it's only been around, you know, a year and a half, and uh, we've already gone leaps and bounds. You know, it went from the uh, meetup in a park, and we still celebrate with meetups in the park, and now these bigger events where we have 140 pilots that have flown here, driven here, uh, Ubered here to uh, come for a big weekend to celebrate FPV. And uh, I mean, it's just great growth, and together we'll grow. Um, I think by just the feedback of what we're going to learn here today and over the course of this weekend. So make sure, you know, you're going to see a lot of the people, the, the lead chapter organizers are some of the biggest ones working out on the big track. Um, a lot of the uh, organizers and, and crew are on the other tracks. And, uh, but I mean, that's just, that's Gen 1. You know, Gen 2, there'll be a lot of people growing up within our multi-GP community taking over these roles. And so, you know, take as much in and ask as many questions as possible. And, uh, and, and you, know, you know, next year, you know, think about how you can contribute to, uh, to up here. Um, in my announcer capacity, I go to this rodeo convention, and they didn't talk anything about rodeo announcing, but I sat through days upon days of marketing and sponsorship and getting volunteers to clean up stuff. And uh, what I've been able to do in my career is just keep stream rolling all these things. So what worked in radio broadcasting actually works in hooking up a DVR and the audio and, and uh, in working with all these other networks and using your past experiences together will grow. Um, one of the big things, this is a draft speech, I actually stole it. I just kind of made everything up here in the back. Um, the, uh, so the first thing that I want to touch on from a, an MC standpoint, um, so far in drone racing, my primary role is like a lot of people that are in that chair, they're you know, from sunup to sundown and, and sweating and stressing, is a race director. And because of my rodeo experience, where I'm a rodeo announcer, and a DJ, and a rodeo announcer's main job is to fill time. So if you've ever been at an event, I like talk at all these different rhythms and I talk about all this stuff because I fill time and I control an energy. That's what I've been trained to do. I was a rodeo clown for 10 years and I've been a rodeo announcer for 14. Um, so I'm, I'm trained in the filling end, but when it comes to a race, obviously we're like, you know, heat one's over here, where's heat number two? You guys should be, you know, making sure that your goggles work and you're, you're, you're in the on deck circle. Where, where, you know, we're, 
as a race director, we're looking for all those people, all those uh, the pilots to be ready. It's always about the pilots, the pilots, the pilots. And then we get on a microphone. Okay, heat number two, three, two, one, go, and they're off. And uh, I don't know where's heat number three. And meanwhile, most people that I've seen in stalking all your YouTube videos as race directors and other events, you're trying to call this thing line of sight. And you know that guy. Now everyone's got you know racecraft uh, props are all the same. So you know you're screwed shooting barbecue. Try and call a race line of sight. As soon as you look away, you're done. Um, so. Um, what I've been able to do, and this is what I strongly will suggest for everyone, is just you know pick your role and just kind of own it. And as long as you look after your race director stuff, as long as you have a good team, if you have a flight line director, which most major uh, major events have, is someone to look after that on deck circle, look after the pilots. If someone's not there, at bigger events, we have a third person who's the usher, who's like, where's pilot number five? Let's go get him from the tent. Um, if you can just kind of calm down and just kind of focus on commentating and being a head race director, then all this other stuff just kind of comes together as smooth as honey. Um, at a recent event uh, that I did, all I did was, uh, I was like a three ring circus announcer for a lot of it. I would just breeze out there. I never talked to anyone unless they were really, really late and I knew them, I'm like what the heck man. But I just go out there and fill the time. And what I'm gonna get to is all of that, even your filler is a tool. Just the way that you deal with people is a tool. And one of my biggest things at any event, whether it's this event, the one I did two weeks ago, a month ago, um, is never the pilot's fault. No matter what, if they're late, it's not their fault. If they're on the wrong channel, it's not their fault. We get destroyed, distracted, we're like, oh, come on, man, you know, get upset with people. And instantly what happens is a race director slash commentator, we have a thing in our hand called the microphone, and all of a sudden we start yelling out, come on, dude, we're waiting on you. Look at all these people waiting on you. And as race organizers, our primary source of income, because I sometimes break even on races, is that pilot. And singling someone out, that kind of sucks. And then with that whole energy, from the filler to the chi, the chi, as I just went over a microphone barking at someone, the chi goes down. And then all of a sudden, when I try and crack jokes with someone, like, oh, is there beer in there? You got vodka in here, don't you? Already people think I'm an a-hole, you know, because this guy, he's like bipolar. So making sure that you kind of respect your role and respect the microphone is, is key. Um, one of the other things that you'll never see me do is go, pilot number five, get over here now, where are you? So and so, blah, blah, blah. I'll never do that. Use a runner for that. This this is only for entertaining, and this is you know the microphone is only for emergency. Um, if I ever bark, if I ever yell on a microphone, I never yell when I'm. Uh, pe people off often ask you know how do you how do you have a voice the whole time? An event I did three weeks ago, I lost my voice because behind the scenes I had to literally yell at people because they're dented. I don't know why. You know you say one thing, they do the other thing. Put a duo over there. Why? Because I told you to. You know. So I lost my voice at that event. But when I'm normally in my simple commentator race director role, I'll never lose my voice because I never yell. I may sound like I'm yelling, but that's just mic technique. And the other thing is you don't want to ruin that chi. If you really want to achieve the job, and there's many things that you're trying to do, you got to keep that chi down. That's why, you know, even when I'm excited, I, I don't even talk excited, I might talk faster, I never yell. I make it sound like it because the mic is an important tool. Um, had I done my PowerPoint, I would have uh, brought this really cool slide up there where at a rodeo, a bull jumped out of the arena and went into the crowd. And uh, I was in Edmonton, Alberta. There's 14,000 people all sitting around this arena indoors and in Northlands where we uh, went for a drone race about a month ago. And all of a sudden this bull is out there. And the announcer, who's got more experience than me, had a microphone in his hand. He went, run, run for your life. <laughs> Heck yeah, the lady who ended up, she's okay now. She got stomped on by a bull. She was in there, she was a big girl. She could have ran, walked, she was gonna get hit anyway. She was not getting out of her seat. That was gonna happen. But for the 14, well, you know, 14,000 people, if you're in the nosebleeds, you're like, hey, y'all, watch this, run. Like, I'm gonna run, the thing ain't gonna get up here. But anyone in that immediate section, they're just gonna run, and what's gonna happen? If you have 500 people sitting together, if all of a sudden we're like, get to the door now, I mean, it would be a stampede and you know, you're gonna you know, screw up the, uh, you know, people are gonna get more hurt by remembering that this thing comes with a lot of power, that microphone. And the same thing as you know, with the drone race, when you're yelling at someone, now everyone is gonna you know, hurt that chi. Um, you know, paging people, you know, if you just keep it more chill, and that's kind of my whole thing, is just keep it chill and just keep going with, that, uh, with the rhythm. One of the things that I often do to learn is I creep when I can online. 
as much as I can to see other races and I've learned from a lot of other events. Uh, love live streams, sitting there for 14 hours to watch six races and you know seeing what happens in between and uh, you know that's how we learn together. And one of the things that sometimes I'm guilty of, sometimes I'll put a little haterade online and you shouldn't do that because we're a community, we're a family. But when I go to an event, and I do this at rodeos mostly, is I just do as much haterade as possible. And I just look at it from whatever position, whether it's a competing announcer, as a participant, you know, we do this in drone racing too. You go to an event, write a list of everything you like and everything you don't like. Be nice about it, don't share that list, and unless they're paying you, don't give them the list. They don't, they're not paying you to consult. But some of the biggest things that I do, and I broke my rule today, because uh, it's under my box that I haven't unloaded yet, but I went to a rodeo watch, and I, a rodeo once, and I watched an announcer walking around with a piece of paper out, climbing the fence, and he looked like a monkey trying to make love to a football. And I'm like, you know what? He looks stupid. Why do I need you to carry a clipboard? It looked way more professional. So just taking little subtle notes on how you can better yourself, it starts off with a hater aid. And then secondly, you gotta do hater aid on yourself as much as you do your competitors. One of the things, one of my tools that I use, um, again, a lot of people are like, three, two, one, go, and away they go, and they're trying to call it line of sight, and they have no idea what's going on, or maybe we're having technical discussions online about, oh, one VTX is better than the other, and blah, 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 this. There's one thing that I do that most people don't do because maybe they're tasked with too many other things, is every race that I commentate, I watch FPV. Does anyone else do that? Every single race they watch FPV running races? A lot of people just go out there and they watch this. Now every time they go green, I'm sitting there, I have a DVR in front of me. So you'll see it at a lot of these fast runs because it's all about efficiency, is when pilots go to seat, so like I got no video, and I'm like, you got video, it's your goggles. Boom, I already know. That's one of the things that you know, other people are gonna talk today about how do you turn your heats over faster. But I watch it FPV as a race director, so I can you know, help it, got no video, we got video here, we can quickly assess the issue. Um, but every single race watching an FPV is like, that is the magic. Now if you're at that race that was like three weeks ago, it was a big race on an island that was just for sponsors, I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> they're happy, they're very happy. The sponsors were very happy. Uh, no, we weren't. Oh, some of the sponsors were happy. Um, You'll notice uh, that uh, we, we were all doing a bunch of different things and there were different people that slid into the race director role and all of a sudden, the guy from ESPN, who Charlie, who does do drone racing, um, he's actually from Live RC, he does car races and he stepped into my role and everyone's like, wow, man, he was amazing, did you hear that? I'm like, yeah, it was good that I could be replaced like that, that easily. <laughs> and then he didn't have the same feedback online. Uh, everyone online's going, oh, dude, why didn't they have Scully's feet on there? This guy had no idea what was going on. And the reason was, what he was watching was exactly what was on the screen. And that was just, here's your leader, here's this other guy. But as soon as he had the tools in front of him, the tools for race directing slash commentary, is the DVR is primary. So instantly you know if someone has a video issue. Instantly you know who's bleeding over who because you know, it's, they, they, just, they bleed over your screen. You see your channel one, two, three, four. You're, you're fast like that, but then, when it comes to calling a race, it is so simple, it's easy. Um, I've been nicknamed the John Madden of FPV, I'll lose that nickname soon because my job is very replaceable, it's very easy to do. As a rodeo announcer, I'm one of 130 in the world with professional accreditation with a PRCA. With all these big events, I'm getting a lot of the nods, but I know I'm just riding the coattails as long as, you know, as long as I can because other people are gonna learn it, and it's by events like this. And it's people like saying, here are the secrets. And because I wanna go to an event where someone's like, wow, that guy's so much better than you. I wanna sit there and I wanna haterade. I'll high five, but I'm haterating because I'm like, I wanna do that better, I wanna do that better, I wanna, you know, we can learn from each other. First and foremost is the DVR. So when we watch, you know, watch line of sight, oh, there's two going through the chicane over there, oh, Red Props is leading, that was, I have no idea. The DVR, as soon as you see double, if we use, I usually run eight at a time, as soon as you see double, those who, who are battling, if you're using Lap Sync or Live Time or RC Scoring Pro, we have a, the seat number. So instantly you see double, you see who the pilots are, now you have a battle to call out. It is so simple. And so we took the Live RC SPN guy, zero to hero, on Sunday morning, because he actually had the tools. And so, by having the proper tools at your discretion, you'll do a much easier job. When it comes to all this tech issue, you know, the thing is, there's some people that have been in this industry for 35 years, and I, you know, this guy doesn't know, this guy knows, I know what I'm talking about. 
but it's like you don't watch every race FPV. And, I, and if you really want to succeed at this, I highly recommend it. It's the first thing that my big investment was a DVR unit that's able to capture all eight feeds, 480, 480 at uh, 30 frames a second. So we can do full replays. We can go back later. And then the biggest thing for me, um, on, in addition from a marketing end, is we can now recreate those races and do a better job because the live commentary is never as good as a scripted one. I would show you examples if I could have done my PowerPoint. But uh, being able to, uh, going back, the other thing that I do, which is uh, a lot of people think it's a diva thing, but uh, I record every race I do on that DVR, the audio. And the reason is when I go home and I'm doing, you know, getting ready for the next event, is I sit there and I just listen to those races over and over and over again. Some of them are exciting. When we're at the FPV Air Show in France, we went till 3 o'clock in the morning and Strepto, who's uh, uh, Mark, I can't remember it was his birthday today, Mark Coquito, uh, Final Glide Oss's uh, flying mate or whatever, he and I were at 2.30 in the morning hammered off our asses doing commentaries. The funniest thing I ever heard. But I listened to that and I also heard the main race where I missed two battles. And so by recording, you have the DVR, it's going to help you live. Now you have your audio after the fact, you just keep playing it back over and over and over again and you can see you know, what you're missing. And I have not called a race, a heat, 100%. Not one. I've never been happy because I rain the hater aid on everyone just as much as myself. And that's one of the biggest tools, I think, that uh, anyone in this uh, situation, even if you don't want to get into the commentary end, um, I would definitely go that route. One of the other things back onto the, you know, the chi, the microphone, is knowing your audience. Who do you think the audience is this weekend? Who are we going to be talking to over the microphone? Pilots. Pilots. Okay, that's what we think. A bunch of rippers. Yeah. <laughs> Who brought their wives, their girlfriends with them today or this weekend? Anyone? You guys. Oh, there we are. There we are. Be proud. I wish mine could, but too many buffets on the way between here and there, so <laughs> we're on a budget. We like to eat. I like to take her out to nice restaurants. You know, that's what I meant. What do you think I meant? <laughs> what? What I do, and this is, uh, this is kind of the cowboy thing in me, I used to be a Garth Brooks fan, not anymore, because he went Chris Gaines or something and then got fat, divorced his wife. And then, uh, country isn't cool anymore unless you're wearing a ball cap apparently, but uh, Garth Brooks, uh, in one of his videos when I was growing up, he was one of my idols, still kind of is, uh, he was an entertainer, and again, my life is entertainment. And uh, he in this video, it was so random, but it was like a behind the scenes thing where he went up to the nosebleed section and this was, uh, this was like his third last year. I think it was like his No Fences tour. And he's in the documentary, he says, you know what I like to do is I like to sit here in this seat and just imagine what it's like to be this fan. And that guy's a billionaire, like you'd ever be sitting in the nosebleeds. But he goes up there and he's like, how can I make this show special for him? And if you've ever seen a Garth Brooks picture, maybe you haven't seen a video, but you'll always see when he's singing, he's always pointing up at the crowd. Or one of the other things you'll do in stadiums, not as much because, well, now he, I guess he just retired again, but he used to, when he was feeling a little more fighting weight, he used to actually disappear from the stage and he'd run up in the 400 section and come running up and start singing in your section. Like, wow, what an awesome experience, right? So the same thing, now, with I do rodeo, I'm talking to spectators. I also do RC car racing. I've been doing that for about four and a half years and drone racing now for two is I look at the market, and the market that I speak to is actually like four different people. So first and foremost, and this came from rodeo, when I was a rodeo clown, if I could make a competitor laugh, I knew I was doing, you know, doing a good job as a rodeo clown because it wasn't a canned joke, it was something original. I'm like, boom, you know, that's a win for me. When it comes to RC car racing and drone racing and stuff, all we talk to, like you said, are the pilots, you're talking to the pilots. Now if I can, you know, what do the pilots want to know? All they want to know is, you know, who's up, who's leading, that's it. It's pretty boring. But, you know, then all of a sudden a FPV race never starts on time or ends on time. Sometimes they'll do one or the other. Very rarely they'll do both, except when we're in Miami. Yes, Krill, we end, started and ended on time. World record. Um, what I try and do a lot of times is I try and talk to the significant others, to be politically correct. The wives, the girlfriends, the uncles, the brothers, whoever is there who's, uh, you know, putting on the props for people or whether they're just hanging out because, you know, this is your only weekend together. And it's kind of random, but if we can entertain in our entertainer role, if we can make it interesting for those girlfriends, then they're not going to want to leave as fast, right? And if they're not, come on, honey, oh, you know what? 
just take your B main award and just get out of here. Oh, you know what? You're, you're not going to beat that guy anyway. If we can avoid that, <laughs> if we can avoid that, I mean, it makes the experience better for the pilots, right? And the pilots, and a lot of times, and I'll use rhythm, and a lot of times I'll talk at a you know, fast rhythm because what do the pilots want to know? You know, who's up, what race are we on, who's leading, bum, 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 and I'll do that. Here's, okay, that guy went around, he was a 24.3, next guy comes up, bum, bum, bum. So pilots know that when it's a chant, and this is very subliminal stuff because we do this, we're together for 14, 18 hours a day, but this is all contrived. Like, this is what I've been trained to do, is so I talk to the pilots in one way, but then all of a sudden I'll start talking to the girlfriends. Now, a lot of people know I'm not an FPV pilot. I have a 60.6 second record in Freerider in the desert. I know what an ESC is, but I could probably not solder it on. In fact, I could not solder it on. There's no way. But, you know, that is something of interest to... Yeah, the video will always be good. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the one thing is, uh, you know, I can explain it to the girlfriends, the grandmothers, the kids, and keep them entertained and engaged, but I don't need to explain it to a pilot. So you'll hear in my conversation when I'm doing that filler stuff that the pilots don't need to know. I, I want the pilots to kind of tune me out. Like, oh, he's talking about VTX again. I wonder which one's his favorite, blah, blah, blah. I'm not even going to listen to him anymore. But at the same time, I can talk to all the, you know, the, the spectators as they were. Because in drone racing, those significant others, those are the spectators. And so I spent a lot of time speaking to them. Um, which is my filler, which makes it entertaining for them. And it makes it a better experience for all of us. And then the other big audience that we talk to a lot, so we pilots, spectators, I guess the third one I'm missing, any guesses? Food vendors. Food vendors. <laughs> Pretty close. Sponsors. So I spent a lot of time working with the sponsors. And the biggest thing, um, I was going to be a little more interactive. I was going to... I was going to write out a list of sponsors and have someone do it, but I'll just cut to the chase because I ran out of time because Chris talked shorter than I thought he was going to. <laughs> this is uh, something that a lot of events do. Here's a list of sponsors, and we see them on our gates and so forth. And, and uh, I've been, even been at events, rodeo and otherwise. They're like, man, you got to talk about the sponsors more. It's sponsor, sponsor. I haven't heard all the sponsors. I haven't heard all the sponsors. And what everyone does is they just want to thank our sponsors, Team Black Sheep, Fat Shark, Ready Made RC. You know, they just start rambling off that list of sponsors. And what happens, same as when I'm talking to the pilots, same as when I'm, I'm with one rhythm, I'm talking to the significant others in another rhythm, soon as you hear a laundry list, you're already tuned out. You know, at the end of the day, you're like, I get it, it's on my t-shirt, thank you, that's it. So what I do is I literally talk to the sponsors. When I have a chance, um, I'll you know, have conversations with them. Other times I don't have the time. Sometimes if I don't know what it is, I'll go to their website real quick, maybe get their tagline. And instead of doing a laundry list of sponsors, what I'll do, and, and doing that like four times a day, if you have eight sponsors, instead of just doing a laundry list where they get tuned out, I'll actually talk about them like one time at a race, which is crazy. It's a low amount of time. But if I spend two minutes just talking about a sponsor, and you notice sometimes I work in comedy or I try to. Um, if you can do that with a sponsor, like I'll do reverse PAs a lot of times. Sometimes they're like, you know, this sucks, this makes it better. Like, you know, the Sham Wow commercial. If you can make that, people get more engaged and especially when I'm, I'm going to be a smart ass about something, more people are listening like who's, who's he going to make fun of now. So understanding that when you have that mic in your hand, you know, you're, you're talking to all these different people and if you focus on it and uh, you know, that, that definitely gets you spades. Now, one of the other things that I've really built on is the transparency and the credibility. And at this, uh, at a big race that was just for the sponsors, and some of them were happy, some weren't. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, uh, that I had, a lot of people didn't see what I was doing at that event. I was on mic, and that, that's the second part. But what I was doing for most of the time when I lost my voice is behind the scenes, we were trying to get the, the flow, the throughput up to where it should have been and we never really got there until the 11th hour of the event was almost over. So I'd go behind the stage and start trying to organize and be in that race director mode. But every time that I came out, and I was running, and I never run, unless it's for that buffet dinner with the wife on the way down here, you know what I mean? And so we're running around, we're bouncing around, and all of a sudden when I'd come out there, I would slow right down 
and then I'd just be totally truthful. You know, a lot of people, you know, it's a drone race. Guys, we're going to start in two minutes. <laughs> yeah, right. Two minutes means ten, right? It's a drone race. It never starts in two minutes. Even when you say two minutes, less than five, the only time it's real is when I say less than five, you know? Well, in about five seconds, it should go. But when we're two minutes, it's never two minutes. And so the biggest thing, because at that big race, I had spectators and, uh, and the pilots couldn't even hear me where the, there was no PA for them. So all I had to work with were the on-deck pilots, the pilots are up, and the spectators over there. And so I'm like, this is actually gonna be fun for me. I have people to talk to at a drone race. I never have that before. And so I'd be completely transparent and credible. So like, dude, it was so bad right now. There's a guy, I won't say which one, but he's ordering his burger. So once that's out of the way, we're gonna be about five minutes, we'll start. <laughs> Go talk amongst yourself. Kind of funny, but it was actually what was happening. Like the guy was literally ordering his burger. And, and so a lot of people appreciate that because, you know, when you hear, you know, five more minutes, it actually is five more minutes. And soon as you start BSing, which we don't really do this in drone racing other than the time thing, um, but in larger events with, uh, with rodeo and stuff like that, and I've done all kinds of performance-based stuff, but, you know, we'll be, uh, we'll try and, shy away from something or you know a lot of my colleagues will try and shy away for something and the biggest thing to engage your audience whether it's the pilots the sponsors or the significant others the spectators as it were and the, is to you know be real you know just as you don't want to scream just like you don't want to incite in, uh, a panic you got to keep your credibility the whole time through um, you know you want to lose your credibility do crazy stuff at night um, so the uh, the, uh, yeah, that's what I like to do. Uh, one of the other things that uh, you'll notice, you know, when I break up my segues, I try and throw a punch in. And this is one of my race director tips, if you will. Um, when I do a pilot meeting, you know, we always, no walking on the course. Be ready when the race before you is, is ending, so you're on the on-deck circle. The stuff that we hear every single race over and over and over again. We're required to say that, because if you get hit, it's your own fault and so forth. But if all of a sudden there's something really, really important that I want to I wanna hit on, then I'll stop and I'll like completely try and crack a joke or fail. And sometimes when I fail on a joke, it's funnier when I actually hit you know, the punchline and stuff like that. And so I use humor a lot to really drive home, um, drive home my message. Um, so the, uh, I guess uh, the last thing that I would uh, uh, I'd, I'd stress on, and, and that's from the commentary standpoint. So a lot of these events are live streamed, and you know that is the fourth audience. That's who's ever watching online. And you know sometimes there isn't a live stream. Sometimes there's 300 people watching a Periscope, and you have no idea. You're rolling around on the floor, in New York City, and you're on Periscope. 300 people, including your wife, who's <laughs> saying, "Why are we not at the buffet right now?" Um, so one of the one of the I guess pro tips is um, always remember that you know just because you can't hear yourself on a PA doesn't mean that you can't be heard. And uh, I'm a cowboy and I'm a high tech redneck and I like to swear a lot, like a lot, like a trucker. And that's my release. Instead of screaming at people, I'll just drop f bombs like I'm you know Eminem behind the scenes. But one of the things to always remember is through the PA you can't hear it, but on a live stream, a mic behind you like this, they can hear that in their living rooms all day long, which was the Mega Drone X. Um, <laughs> they, they definitely heard some F-bombs across America on that one. But uh, you know, something to be cognizant of. And then you know, you're talking to that audience. And, and you know, at this day and age of the game, uh, because I'm in different roles, I'm a commentator, race director, and now I'm a host on a live stream, it's very hard to you know, try and balance it but just you know, kind of understand who you're talking to and plan out your next thing, and uh, and definitely deliver home. To make it engaging, though, um, is to try and come up with that storyline, and it's a tough balance in house, um, out of house. If it's live stream, if pilots can't hear you, it's awesome. You can say this guy sucks. There's no way. Look at this. He's gonna wreck out on this guy. Boom, he's down. You know, it's entertaining as heck to watch on a live stream. When you call out a guy, the guy's gonna suck. Sometimes, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's at home when he sees it later, you know, so you don't have to have words. But <laughs> in house, I mean, it's very distracting. And one of the things that, uh, that I have is uh, we've identified, and at least in last year's races, is the curse. And, uh, and I wasn't doing it intentionally, but we'd do a race, and I'm like, and high winds leading, down he goes. Next up, Ockbot, 
down he goes. As soon as I mention the name, they crashed because they're just not used to, oh my gosh, this is real, right? And everyone knows FPV, you know, it's just you, what you see and what you hear. It's just, it's like on steroids, everything coming, coming together. Um, so it is hard to come up with a storyline that isn't distracting. And one of the things that I do in all sports, rodeo, drone racing as well, is I always try and uh, root on the underdog. And so because I'm watching that underdog FPV, you know, I'll sometimes coach them. And sometimes that's a story. Sometimes the leaders are battling it out and you know, they're gonna battle it out and wreck each other. They'll have a midair in the next 20 seconds. So forget about them. We got this other guy. He's gonna finally make his first lap of the day. Let's ride with him. And you know, try and do it in a non-distracting way. Don't say this guy sucks. He's finally gonna make his lap. But you know, <laughs> what a day it's been. You know, this is round number five, but we're on board with new guy. And new guy is finally at that final turn. He's gonna make it, guys. He's gonna make it, boom. And so now, you know, line of sight, and even when you're watching online or when you're watching on the screen, everyone's like rooting that guy on. And I try and come up with a storyline like that every single heat. Sometimes it's hard when you know, we have things blowing up that we're trying to fix, but always trying to come up with that, that storyline. And at the, pro, at the pro rodeo circuit, you know, it's eight second battles, one at a time, one at a time. So I have to do a storyline every single time. And heat eight, you know, it's sometimes hard. And you know, you're also in an official capacity of uh, being a race director so you can't be picking favorites. If the one you talk about wins all the time then you know no one's going to go to your races and you're going to get flamed online but um, you know trying to come up with that storyline keep people engaged and you know later in the day sometimes it's easier earlier in the day um, you know use those stats the uh, the stats that I use that's my go-to it's kind of my crutch but you know early in the day we're talking about you know fast lap fast lap fast lap and you know we see the last five laps ramble them off and especially if they're getting sequentially faster and if it's only a three lap race 90 percent chance of the time they're getting sequentially faster but you know it gets everyone a little more excited like oh everyone's doing good you know um so working on that storyline gives uh, anyone and everyone a reason to cheer on someone i mean it's a it's a community where we see it every single race where Everyone, you know, will help the next person to get back in the air, whether, you know, they need a new antenna or a new camera, like, come on, let's solder it in together, whatever. Um, but uh, coming up with that storyline just keeps everyone more into it, whether it's the sponsors. The sponsors are sitting in that tent all day. They're like, oh, this is the last two races, no one's going to buy anything from me now. You know, so let's entertain them a little bit. You know, of course, we, want, we don't want you guys being rushed out by whoever should be driving you home because you've been drinking too much championship uh, champagne, you know. So, and of course, the pilots as well. So keep it, so building those storylines and following them. And uh, I think that's... That's about it. I mean, the way that I go, thank you, buddy. Um, uh, way, the way that I go at it is, uh, again, I, I try and tear apart every performance that I do. I tear and, uh, you know, I also write down the good. When I go into every event that I go into, even this one, there are like two or three things that I want to try new whether it's something subtle or something grand. So for me, um, you know, since May of last year, all I've done is events, rodeo, motorsports, drone racing. This has been the biggest blessing for me. And that's why like, you know, it's almost like a religious experience for me when I got into drone racing that, you know, as a cowboy in the Northeast, rodeo, you know, there's, there's snow banks. We don't get to rodeo in the winter. And all of a sudden, drone racing was able to help me live my dream that, you know, in the winter I could go places and continue doing events and entertaining and educating and, uh, uh, you know, it's turned into a career for me. Chris Thomas said, you know, there's very few people that can do it professionally. That's true. And like I said, you know, my blessing is this industry that has embraced me and I'm trying to give as much back at it. And I know, it, you know, riding those coattails as long as I can, but this has really enhanced my career. It's, uh, I love the heck out of it. And it's just, you know, events like this where we get to meet each other and, and see each other compete and, and learn from each other. And, you know, if you, uh, the cliche, if you love your job, you'll never work a, a day in your life. And, you know, I kind of live by that, obviously. And, uh, you know, but we work hard and play hard and we enjoy every minute of it. And, you know, we're a family and, you know, I can't wait to be here next year and see who else is up here talking for 32 minutes longer than Chris Thomas. Thanks, guys.